The first one was uh, uh, Can Mara, the inner critic, misguide right effort? How can this be mitigated? Yeah, well, like anything, uh, like uh, anything, anything that balances, it can <laughs> it can get out of balance. Uh, right can uh, easily drift to uh, uh, to one side or another, and so that's the nature of uh, the organic processes. Um, yeah, so with with effort, it can easily be wrong effort, micha vayama. Uh, Sama means uh, attuned or balanced, Micha means out of tune or imbalanced. So that uh, yeah, we can try too hard um, and with, with good intention, we can um, say, uh, stress ourselves and become uh, say, exhausted, overexerting. Um, and so that then the, uh, the, uh, our sincerity or commitment then can lead to agitation and um, uh, just more more disturbance and uh, the effort is being made but it's is producing more uh, more stress and, and difficulty uh, in the uh, in the mind in the heart and similarly uh, we can uh, uh, try uh, to uh, uh, to be content or to be peaceful uh, and so that uh, misguided efforts towards contentment being peaceful relax we we switch off. We, uh, we drift towards dullness and sleepiness and uh, dis uh, disconnection. So their uh, effort um, and I, I, my intention is to address this uh, area a bit more uh, tomorrow. Uh, for those of you who are hopefully will be uh, carrying on tomorrow, but uh, certainly uh, things easily get out of balance. There can be um, can, uh, misguided uh, energy, misguided uh, efforts at, uh, at contentment. And it's uh, essentially it's mindfulness, sati, that uh, is uh, overseeing that the process is that which is the um, the kind of primary balancing agent is, is mindfulness. So that if you are putting in a lot of effort, you're really uh, working hard at your practice, and then mindfulness is that that element that in a way is the the fuel for uh, wise reflection. And that uh, helps to bring that realization. Well, I'm, you know, there's a lot of effort being made, but this is just creating more busyness, more agitation, more tension in the system. This is um, this is misdirected. This is not helpful. This is not leading to liberation. It's just leading to more uh, stress and exhaustion. Uh, similarly, mindfulness can recognize. Well, yeah, this is peaceful, but uh, actually, it, it's uh, what um, what uh, Ajahn Sumedha would call the the uh, the the peacefulness of a of a water buffalo it's not a very bright or alert kind of peacefulness it's a a peacefulness that is it's very uh, sleepy and uh, dull and disconnected um, and it, it can be very deceptive particularly with uh, with dullness and sleepiness because it can be very peaceful and uh, it's one of those aspects of meditation that um, can be very problematic particularly if you're always meditating by yourself you don't have people nearby that you can easily get into habits of sleepiness without realizing it at all um, and uh, in my my early um, months and, and years uh, in Thailand when I was a, a, a novice there I remember making a comment to one of the other novices I said oh the the evening sittings they um, they seem to go on forever and I get really you know, uncomfortable and uh, very agitated and also lots of mosquitoes around in the evening so um it's uh, much uh, much harder to concentrate i said but then in the morning time you know my mind is, is very very peaceful there's not so many mosquitoes around it's uh, it's much easier uh to to meditate and and my mind is much more peaceful and my fellow novice said well that's because you're half asleep i thought you know what do you mean he said yeah you're totally out of it the whole time <laughs> and I, I thought i was uh you know paying attention and was alert um uh, but he said uh, that you know, he was sitting next to me so he knew no your kind of your nose is down on your chest you're fast asleep half the time so well, that's why the the sitting seemed to go by so quickly <laughs> in the morning time so it can be deceptive and this is also where your um 
your friends, your Kalyanamita, your spiritual companions can really be helpful. Uh, also other members of the Buddhist group or people who um, you look to as a, a teacher or as a, a, a fellow um, a meditator, that they can point those kind of things out to you. Like, you know, they can say both with, with too much you know, energy, trying too hard. It's like, you know, you're looking really exhausted or... Um, you, uh, you, uh, you, you're very sincere about the meditation, but you, 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 you do look really uh, harrowed and stressed. You know, are you, are you okay? <laughs> uh, or similarly, you know, they can, a friend can point out. You know, do you realize that you're, you know, that you're snoring? You know, from about five minutes into the meditation. You know, not sure whether you can hear it or not, but that uh, it's very, it's very audible to the people sitting around you, and um, you know, with with great kindness and friendliness one can make these kind of comments to help where we can help each other out in this way so that uh, uh, anyway I, I will uh, my intention is to talk a little bit more about those um so uh, extremes and working with energy and relaxation and balancing the practice that's uh say my, uh, my aim to be addressing that tomorrow um let's see mm. The mind and body has needs that, if not met, lead to disease, dysfunction, and if met skillfully, lead to health and functioning. We cannot let go of our needs. How do we combine the teaching of letting go, non-identification, with the reality of physical and psychological needs? Um, well, again, that, this is one of the things that I sort of began with today, is that people can uh, misunderstand when we talk about non-attachment, non-identification, it can be taken to mean uh, a kind of zoning out of dissociation or a, 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 an ignoring of the, the needs of the body, the, our relationship with the people around us, and our family, and the, uh, in the, um, the living uh, situation that we have. Uh, and so that uh, I would say that it's uh, when there is genuine non-attachment, non-identification, then the mind is more accurately attuned to the needs of the body. We're more aware of uh, our state of health or illness and, and uh, more alert to what might be a skillful way of handling it. Uh, Non-attachment is not passivity. It's not passivity. Peace is not passivity. And uh, many, many times people misread, uh, and, and I think it's from misunderstanding or maybe being given... Uh, meditation instruction in an unhelpful way or way that has been misinterpreted but uh, when we talk about non-attachment or non-identification or even not doing it doesn't mean to say we stop breathing or we stop moving when we talk about letting go of becoming it doesn't mean we sort of are frozen in mid-step on our walking path it means let's say tuning into that aspect of our nature which is not going anywhere which is ever present which is that timeless aspect of, of Dhamma, of reality. Um, and so similarly, letting go of, uh, of attachment, letting go of identification, uh, it doesn't mean ignoring the needs of the body. It doesn't mean um, not paying attention to your you know, to illnesses or injuries or, or the people around you. Uh, rather, it's quite the opposite, that uh, the mind is more attuned in an unbiased way so that we look after our own needs, our own hunger, our own comfort, discomfort, um, with uh, with an attunement, but also without a um, uh, without a bias, without a, a, a reactivity conditioned by aversion or desire or fear or, or opinions. But it's uh, far more, say, um, uh, aligned to the way the natural system is working. So that's. You know, they, and this is one of the things that really attracted me towards Buddhism uh, early on was that sense of how the the, the Buddha's middle way was uh, it was a, it was very livable and it was very uh, sort of intuitively um, so well integrated with, with life and society. So that uh, we live on alms food, we live on what we're given. But we're not encouraged to be starving ourselves or eating sort of five rice, five grains of rice a day. You know, if that's all we get, then that's what we live on. But if the next day we get a bowl full of rice and, and cakes and whatever, 
vegetables, then fine, you can <laughs> fill up the, the day after. You know, you, you're content with getting very meager offerings, but you're also content with getting very abundant offerings and listening to the needs of the body, then you, you uh, adjust and, and cater to that uh, as is appropriate. So uh, I, I fast for about three weeks, twice a year. And so the, uh, with a day or two after the, the fast is over, I have a substantial hunger. <laughs> the body is uh, definitely looking forward to, uh, to food. Um, but that's you know, the natural result of having fasted uh, for three weeks. Then, yeah, the, the body says, hey, food, come on. <laughs> Let's uh, get with the program. And, uh, and so that's, that's a, 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 say that kind of hunger or you know, even without fasting, you know, just uh, or in the ordinary course of a day, that's not a defilement. That's just the, the needs of the body looking forward to the next breath or wanting the next in-breath, that's not a defilement or a problem, it's just the body's respiration. That's, there's nothing uh, obstructive or problematic in that. So I think that there's a, 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 a like a, a, with the idea of progress or having a goal, then uh, the, the understanding of peace and non-attachment is uh, is very, very common in the, the world of Buddhist meditation. And that when we are, say, focusing on a, uh, on a, uh, say, a sensation in the body or, you know, feeling in the body, when we are trying to be unattached to a, a feeling or a sensation, it doesn't mean that we just freeze the body in a single posture and say, you know, non-attachment, non-attachment, non-attachment. <laughs> it's the, the, the mind is relating to that painful feeling is attuned to it, is aware of it, but if the 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 uh, uh, and they can be patient with that and not being uh, not being uh, say uh, say drawn into aversion or anxiety about it, but after a period of time there can be the intuitive wisdom. Okay, now that was the, this is painful, but also there's a sense that that knee joint is really being put under a lot of stress, and now's the time for the body to move, not out of I impatience or in your restlessness, but rather out of kindness to the body, so that it's a, uh, there's a, a shifting of the posture, uh, there, but it's it's something that's completely completely in accord with the needs uh, of the body, so that you're not foolishly wrecking your knees or your back or, or some other uh, joint out of some kind of uh, idealism, and so that uh, I feel this is a in this area of understanding. Um, how to apply effort in an attuned way, it, 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 uh, it's, it's much more uh, of a, a sort of natural organic process. You're coming from a place of attunement rather than a place of idealism or how it should be or what I've decided to do or, or, uh, or um, say, uh, I, should, you know, I need to be peaceful, therefore I can't do anything, any kind of adjustment or adaptation or change is therefore uh, an intrusion on on peace. Um, I would say that's a, a misunderstanding of what peace is. That peace really is in the skillful attitude. It's not in whether the the body moves or not, or whether we look after an illness or not. So next question: um, How to avoid thoughts in a chatter disturbing your meditation? How much does right intention input to effective effort? Um, well, with uh, with thinking, um, certainly if the mind is is uh, chattering less, it, it's uh, there's a natural uh, peacefulness or comfort with that. But I, I feel it's also helpful to understand that thought is just another sense object. Like the eye perceives light, the ears perceive sound, the the body perceives sensations, the nose odors, and the tongue's flavors. The mind perceives thoughts. So just as you can sit and you feel the weight of the body, you feel the sensation of cloth on your skin, you hear the sound of the of cars on the road or birds in the, in the trees or the wind going through the bushes, That's, that those sensations or those sounds don't have to be an intrusion on your peacefulness at all, that they're just part of the experiential field. So similarly, thought can be recognized in exactly the same way. It's just that the 
the wind in the in the trees or the chattering of the birds or the the sound of the traffic because we have a, a a weird kind of conditioning that we assume that if we think something it's true and it's meaningful and i i don't know how many times over the recent years i've i've talked about this but it's it's a very peculiar assumption to make that just because we think it uh, it doesn't mean it's true and it doesn't mean it's useful or meaningful at all it's like a lot of our thoughts are just tunes that we've heard on the radio or uh, playing in the background on the computer or they're just or a a, 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 a conversation that you've seen on a, on a tv program or on a youtube video or something that was said uh, over breakfast that morning it's it's not you're not even interested in it it's just running through your memory as a as a song or a conversation or a jingle or a uh, a line from a from a film so <laughs> why should that be meaningful or or, or uh, say significant so i feel it's it's more, most helpful to and again we can use wise reflection to get a bit more space uh, around this to to consider our thoughts just like overhearing the neighbor's radio like if you're sitting in your garden and someone next door has got the radio going in their garden on a summer's day it's our thoughts can be just like hearing the sound of the neighbor's radio you didn't even choose the station you can hear it you can understand the words but so what it's there but you don't have to make anything of it or like the the conversations between the birds you know what, what are the pigeons saying to each other yeah it's their business you know you don't have to be interested or make anything of it uh, what what meaning does the rustling of the leaves have well it doesn't mean anything it's just the sound of the leaves it's just that's what they do in the wind so similarly we can relate to use wise reflection to disengage the interest or belief uh, from our, our thoughts and, and not imbue them with with value and meaning that, that they don't necessarily have by my, my rough calculation i say about five percent of our thoughts during a day actually have some kind of value and meaning 95 percent is just um the reverberations of the day and half heard conversations and bits and pieces that you you, you remember from uh you know from what you've seen or heard from other people not particularly important or valuable so when we change the way that we relate to thought and just think of it as the, the you know regard it as the chattering of the birds or the rustling of the leaves then it can be there but it's not so disturbing uh, of course yeah you know, it can if there isn't any wind in the trees or there isn't any traffic going by the window then there's <laughs> a more uh, de delicious quietness but I, as i was saying peace comes from right attitude from a, a skillful attitude far more than it does from the world you know uh, shutting down now you, you can be in the middle of a of a, a lot of noise a crowd of uh, of uh, busy people and with a skillful attitude you can be completely at peace and, and the mind can be totally quiet even with loud noises going on all around you and so let's see how much does right intention input into effective effort yeah so um uh, with respect to that um yeah setting the intention you know like say the beginning of a period of meditation or the beginning of a day set the intention okay whether it's pleasant or painful what can i learn from it um okay i have a strong habit of worrying so whenever worry arises then rather than taking that personally just look at it as uh, the mind here is a mind here is a body there's a capacity to worry worry arises it's not me or mine it's not who and what i am it's just the feeling of worrying that that's all um so remember that so uh we can uh say uh create a lot of benefit from establishing skillful intentions so uh, uh and i used to do this as a as a particular practice uh, as i was a a, a a kind of habitual warrior and uh, every day during the morning meditation i would set that intention okay during today whenever my mind moves towards anxiety or worry whether it's something internal or external then notice that that the, uh, the mind is worrying bring the attention into the body notice that feeling of stressing and tightening in in the in the belly in the in the chest 
Notice that, feel that, and let the, 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 the body relax. And then uh, look and see where, you know, if the worry is still there. So uh, that was like a conscious setting of an intention. Um, and that was extremely helpful. So, you know, over like, two or three years, there was a, a very conscious learning of how worry works <laughs> and was able to really steer the mind. I was able to steer the mind in a very different direction. So I would say that that skillful intention, setting consciously setting a direction, again, based on, on wisdom and mindfulness rather than on, I want to be like this, I don't want to be like that. I've got an, I've got an anxiety problem. I need to get rid of my anxiety. Then there'll be me with that anxiety. But no, <laughs> that's setting things up in an unskillful way. Rather, anxiety tends to arise. Uh, let it be noticed whenever anxiety arises. And then when that arises, then it, it's appropriate to make the effort to know that, to feel that, and to let go of it. And when it's been let go of, see what happens. So that uh, it's not me and my problem, but here is the awake mind seeing the way things are. So there's a changing of the paradigm uh, there in that setting that intention as well. And the next one is, what is the right attitude approach to setting a goal? <laughs> Again, um, you know, the, the more that a goal is set without uh, being free of self-view rather than, I want to be this way, I don't want to be that way, you know, uh, I haven't got to where I want to go. I need to get there. When I get there, then I will be happy. The, the more the, there's I and me and mine involved, and that's taken as solid and real, then uh, that any making of an effort or having a goal is going to be stressful. And so uh, if, uh, if a, a direction is set, like this is a potential, say that the, um, our heart, our mind can be free of all uh, of all distress all difficulty all limitation that's a possibility so uh, let there be a, uh, the direction set uh, towards that that freedom that that contentment and let's see what happens so rather than you know i've i'm like this i want to be like that um uh, the, the the there's a conscious setting of a direction in the, uh, towards what is beneficial for this being for other beings uh, and away from what is harmful or, or obstructive. But uh, if that is completely free of self-view, then the work can be done, the effort can be uh, exercised, but without that uh, self-obsession. So that uh, when there is a skillful attitude, then it completely changes the way that the mind relates to ideas of success and failure. That uh, uh, when, when things go well, rather than, Yay, I got that right. I'm really progressing. This is really good. Hooray, you know, that we should like grasping success. Rather, it's uh, it, it's held in a different way. Like, well, okay, this is this looks like it's heading in a good direction. This is very pleasant. It seems very positive. Okay, what can we learn from this? Uh, what what am I taking for granted? Is there an attachment to this success or this this pleasant quality? Uh, and so there's there isn't that getting drunk on success and and uh, and uh, getting lost in it or taking it for granted uh, similarly when there's a failure and you, you take a wrong direction you get on the wrong train you think i'm not in berkhamstead i'm in bradford how did i get here yeah <laughs> okay um i better find a train that's going south because you know the, the, i've ended up in a part of the country i, I didn't want to be in so uh uh, let's recognize that I made a mistake there and let's, uh, let's turn it around. Yesterday I was putting some shelves, or trying to put some shelves together with some other monks. And um, there was these handy dandy, no, uh, no screws, no bolts, no nuts needed. You just clip them together. Just. <laughs> so uh, we uh, attempted to put these, uh, these shelves together and um, it was getting extremely um, challenging that the, the the just clipping together the just wasn't quite happening so we we managed about 15% um, of what we were intending to do um, but then after some vigorous effort and some thoughtful attention we realized well I think we, we need to do some adjustments to how these clips are and these these uh, tags are uh, have been formed on the the different elements of the shelves and just let's just leave it for now and come back with the right with some suitable tools and, and work on it later 
so that it was a basically it was a failure we, we were aiming to put the shelves together the work monk thought well um okay this uh, this this might take them an hour i better find something else for them to do in the in the next in the second part of the morning <laughs> so we didn't get anywhere near completing even half of it we did about 15 percent but uh so it was a failure but rather than making a problem out of it it was like okay well we got that far and we realized that with the tools we've got and the way that this is set up it's not possible to to do the job so we better find some different tools do it a different way and then i heard this morning that they went back and they put the the shelves together very effectively with a bit of tweaking with the the with the appropriate tools to rearrange the the framework and such like so failure uh doesn't have to be a personal problem it's something that we learn from so again rather not like uh, not thinking on oh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm an idiot how could i not do that that's so frustrating that's really annoying we should complain to the manufacturers <laughs> uh, instead you you uh, you set the intention to learn from what's happening so that uh, with uh, the application of of uh, uh, right attitude a skillful attitude we had the goal of putting the shelves together <laughs> But then we we met with a substantial obstruction, and there was no way forward with the the tools that we had and the time that we had. So put it aside, you know, approach it in a different way, and lo and behold, then uh, we, we was able to to achieve the the goal a day later, but without creating any suffering around it. So and then you learn some helpful lessons along the way. We didn't have to get upset or be self critical or complain to the manufacturer. So uh, it's, it makes a huge difference in our life if we uh, are setting goals and noticing how we relate to success and failure. Most of us are, uh, want to succeed and, uh, and, are, and are very afraid of failure, particular, particularly being socially rejected, failing in public. Uh, it's in a famous psychological study by uh, done by Harvard University about 20 years ago, they found that people were more afraid of public speaking than they were of nuclear war. So the number one fear people had was sort of dying on stage rather than the destruction of life on Earth. Seriously, that was the number one thing that people were afraid of, above uh, having your family murdered, uh, being disabled with a, with a, 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 a kind of crippling disease, uh, warfare and a nuclear war number one on the list was fear of public speaking so we're, we can be terrified of dying on stage or being rejected by others or, or, or looking like an idiot uh, because of the attachment to success and fear of failure so if we are able to set goals free of self-view and these eye making and mind making then we find it we can carry out the 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 work that seems to be useful and, and meaningful and everything will teach us whether it goes in a way that we like or a way that we don't like everything teaches us so nothing is wasted even if they hadn't put the shelves together <laughs> even if they that uh, the the news has come back from the work monk today that well i john we tried and it was a complete disaster everything is buckled and, uh, and unusable so we're going to write a polite letter to the manufacturer and say um <laughs> but uh we uh we acquired your product but it didn't uh, it didn't work for us please be aware of this and so on and so forth so next question is wise reflection one of the folds of the eightfold path uh not precisely um the uh, that wise reflection yoniso manasikara uh it's uh, it's in a number of lists as i said it's in the list of the four factors supportive of, um, of stream entry and in other places. Also, another, another term that is very, very similar is Tamma Vijaya, which means investigation of reality. And that is one of the, the seven factors of enlightenment. Um, but the Eightfold Path, uh, it's not uh, on that particular list, but you can see it as um, the, as an aspect of right view, samaditi, a, a, a tuned or balanced view, um, and also an aspect of 
of uh, right uh, intention or attuned intention. So samaditi, sama sankapo. Those, those. You can see that. Um, I, I would say that uh, that wise reflection is uh, an informing quality uh, for those two. What they call the 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 wisdom factors of the eightfold path. Uh, uh, samaditi and sama sankapo. Okay, next one. How can one love without being attached? Is that an aim? Uh, one can recognize the manifestations of that attachment. Is that enough? Uh, big question. Um, and um, I'll try to answer it briefly. I'm not very good at short answers, as you might have noticed. <laughs> so I was uh, briefly, I would say there's two kinds of love. I know there's many kinds of love, but I would say essentially there is love which is possessive. And this is, I realize this is a sweeping statement. Love which is possessive and love which is liberative. So the, 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 the possessive love, in, in Pali that's called Pia, P-I-Y-A, Pia. Or, so that always has an element of attachment and suffering involved with it. Um, so that is, uh, and so the, the, and the Buddha made this very, very clear in a number of teachings that uh, the, if we hold each other in that possessive way, I belong to you, you belong to me, um, uh, whether it's from parent to child or, or um, uh, people uh, to their, their romantic partners, uh, life partners, whether it's to a teacher or a spiritual teacher or, or whatever, if there is that sense of possessiveness, um, then there will be suffering. That, that's, that's a natural part of it because when that that bond is stretched or changed or one of the people within that that bond moves away or dies or their attitudes change, then dukkha pain is the result of that. If love is, if love is liberative, if it's a love that is non-possessive, and when we talk about the uh, loving kindness, metta, or um, karuna, compassion, um, in particular, then that's a, a kind of love that lets go. It's a non-possessive love. So there's a a quality of profound caring. There's a caring, which is sincere and profound, but there isn't any possessiveness. And so, when that is established, then you can say, well, you know, people will say, uh, you know, do you love Ajahn Sumedho? So yeah, I, I love him. He's my teacher. And so, well, do you? When he, he lives here at Amravati now, but when he was living in Thailand, he was so. Do you miss Ajahn Sumedho? I said, no. <laughs> No, oh, that's not very respectful. So how can you not miss him? So, well, if he's around, I enjoy his company and I'm very happy to be close to him. I have great uh, profound respect and, uh, and gratitude towards him. But if he's not present, I don't miss him. My life is not incomplete if he's not around. <laughs> and uh, so sometimes when one, when one speaks in that way, people can think, that's weird. You know? <laughs> or, they, or sometimes people actually say, when I was living in California, I come back to England, uh, to, to visit, um, people say, oh, did you miss Amravati? Do you miss Amravati? Do you miss England? I said, no. Well, now they say, do you miss California? I said, no. <laughs> so it can seem that you can seem a bit hard-hearted or a bit, yeah, a bit stony or, or, um, or uh, yeah, a, a kind of um, sociopathic. <laughs> but I, I would say it's a, it's a, a, a way of loving that is, uh, it is very, very open, very, very easy and very free so that you have a genuine love and care, but you're not looking to that uh, that connection as something that uh, is, uh, is relied upon or that your life is incomplete if that connection is not there. And so I would say that it is indeed possible to love without being attached. And uh, yes, that is an aim. The more that we can we can love each other without that attachment, uh, then I would say, great. Um, but, uh, you know, people are, are, are people and we each are at our own sort of uh, level of relating and, and, uh, and you know, understanding and sort of spiritual, uh, say, connection and spiritual, uh, the way we relate to spiritual teachings and our relationships, that varies enormously from person to person. So, if you are relating to others with a quality of attachment, then you know if that is something that is based upon honesty and generosity and and, uh, and kindness. Well, great. <laughs> so you can still have relationships that are 
based upon attachment that are really wholesome and beautiful and and uh, fine in their own way. It's not like that uh, is intrinsically sort of bad or wrong. I wouldn't say that at all. That would be a misunderstanding of what I'm saying. But I would say that as long as there is that possessiveness, there's going to be pain. That's that's the sort of and the the Buddha was criticised for making that kind of a comment in his own lifetime. But I feel he was absolutely on the mark in that respect. Uh, how, uh, one can recognise the manifestations of that, that attachment. Is that enough? Well, uh, you tell me. <laughs> it's like the uh, I don't know who asked the question, but I think it's test it out for yourself. Uh, uh, if one is recognising that attachment and then seeing what comes with it, is is that enough? What, what, how does that sit in the heart? That those are individual choices, and if if we um, uh, if, if we have that, you know, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved, as they say in that uh, age-old saying, um, then if that's uh, what is meaningful to us, then fine. I can't say you shouldn't be feeling that or that's wrong to have that feeling, but I wouldn't. I would say that's not the whole story, and that uh, it can come uh, about that that uh, yes, you're recognizing the um, how that attachment manifests. But then there can be something in the heart that says, does it have to be this way? Or is there, is there a way of, of getting beyond this? Or, or um, this is really burdensome. Um, this, is, this is something that's really kind of limiting for me, for others that I'm connected with. Is there a different way of relating? So if that arises, then, then there are more sort of teachings and practices that relate to developing that kind of liberative love. But... Um, if uh, uh, if that's not meaningful or uh, appealing, then uh, it, then it, that's up to the individual to 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 judge and to to make their own, we make our own choices around that. Dear Ajahn, I'm very confused about the definition of self and non-self. Why is it that as long as we cannot control something such as the body, then we call it non-self? We cannot control many material things but those are still belong to us. Yes, question mark. Thank you, Ajahn. Well, I would say, no, they don't belong to us. <laughs> I mean, I can say this is my computer, but um, when it stops, uh, stops working, uh, I mean, it's, it's technically it's mine, but if I keel over and die today, then somebody else will inherit this computer. Or if it stops working, then it's not a computer anymore. Um, so that that sense of owning can only be a convenient fiction. Um, uh, and so you, again, we're using wise reflection, we can consider what is there that can be owned and who is there to own it. So uh, like, you know, even the, th not just our, our body, but our, our possessions, you say this, you know, this pen is mine. When the ink runs out, then the plastic of this pen will be recycled. <laughs> it's a, it won't be my pen anymore. At the moment, it's my pen. But where, where is that minus? It's a convenient fiction. If somebody came in, uh, into my kuti here and uh, my, my dwelling and took this and I, I, you know, I didn't know where it is, it wouldn't be my pen anymore. <laughs> It'd be somebody else's or gone somewhere else. So the, uh, the sense of ownership is a convenient fiction. Um, and uh, I, I don't take that as a, as a kind of <laughs> declaration that you have to believe in, but it's, we can use wise reflection and the process of insight meditation to explore that like what can really be owned a building a pair of glasses a computer a desk uh, our thinking faculties yeah any one of us gathered together in this event today yeah we can have an aneurysm uh, with and then within three or four seconds boom our our vision is gone or our memory is gone or our life is gone you know uh, you can have a a stroke and suddenly we don't know who we are. We don't remember our name. We don't know where we are. These things can happen. It's not, uh, it's not fixed uh, and and reliable. So uh, and that can be very distressing, but because we might feel, well, it was mine. <laughs> it was my mind. It was my body. And now the Buddhists are taking it away from me, or the Ajahn's uh, telling me, uh, you know, I can't have it anymore. But I would suggest that it was never really ours. There was no thing. That is really ownable and even the word thing 
uh, is not quite accurate. You know, the word sankara in Pali, it means more like a, an event rather than a permanent object. It's a happening. It's a, it's a pattern of experience rather than a, a single independent thing. So I can, I can say, you know, here is, here is my bell, this little, little Korean meditation bell. And uh, somebody gave that to me a few years ago. So it's my bell. But it, it started out, I imagine, as some iron ore in the ground in Korea or China or somewhere and got dug out of the ground and boiled down and made into iron and steel and brass and formed into the nifty bell shape and then put into a box and somebody bought it and said, I'm going to send this to Ajahn Amaro. <laughs> so now it's mine, it's my bell. But that it, it came together from the elements of the earth and it's in this form for a while. It's, it's an event. It's not a permanent thing. One day the, the elements of it will, will come apart and will dissolve and go different places. It's a slow happening, <laughs> but it's a happening. So there is no thing that can really be owned or can really last. And so that it's recognizing that that's always been the case. And so saying things are not self is a, a way of putting that into a frame, into a different framework that we take things to be who and what we are, like our body, our personality, our memory, our name. Um, like, you know, as I said, I've, I've got a number of names myself. So people know me as uh, Ajahn Amaro or Amaro Bhikkhu. Um, I've got uh, some, some title, a, a title I was given uh, in, in Thailand. Raja Budi Varaguna is another name of mine. It's a long one. <laughs> Before that, it was Videsa Budi Guna. Then that got supplanted by Raja Budi Varaguna. And so who am I? <laughs> What's my name? Yeah. The, uh, so recognizing that any kind of thingness, any kind of name, any kind of ownership can only be a convenient fiction, then in terms of self-view and, uh, and our habits, that's a, ah, don't say that, you know, we feel like we're losing things that are really ours, but from the perspective of wisdom, it's like, well, it was never, there was never a thing to be owned and, and no, no person who could do any owning, really. And so that was been the case right from the get-go. And so the, the, the ego goes, ah, don't say that, but the heart goes, of course, you know, duh, you know, how could it be otherwise? And there's a feeling of relief and wonderment, really, and so there's a, a delight in that, in that recognition. So I hope that your confusion is reduced rather than increased by that response. Um, then the next one is, I always feel good after doing meditation, but that can lead to a focus on the end result and therefore can bring up feelings of impatience and then boredom during sitting. Any advice? Um, well, the, the most helpful thing is to have an attitude of loving kindness and acceptance for whatever is present. And if there's impatience and boredom, then, oh, here's that impatience and boredom that happens on my way to getting where I want to go. Like waiting for the train to get to, way, to the stop that you, <laughs> you want to get to or following your GPS to the, you know, you've still got a few miles to go to get your, to your destin destination. Like, oh, I wish we were there. Are, are we there yet? Why aren't we there yet? And to recognize, yeah, that's a natural feeling that arises. It's like the uh, sitting in the back of the car as a little child, you know, are, are we there yet? Are we there yet? It, it arises, but we don't have to make that a feeling that defines who and what we are. So having loving kindness for negative or uncomfortable feelings, obstructive feelings is a, is a, a very helpful way of seeing that this is part of the, the natural system. Rather than, well, if there's impatience and boredom, we need to get that out of the way so I can get to that. If I didn't have that, then I would just have this pleasant feeling uh, at the end. But rather, if we have a, an accepting attitude towards impatience, boredom, and, uh, and that uh, you know, not quite there yet-ness, <laughs> to coin a, a term, then even there with that, that impatience, it's like, oh, it's like this. And in that moment of acceptance, receptivity, there's a peacefulness, there's a spaciousness, even in the presence of that uncomfortable feeling. Sorry to go off topic, Ajahn, but can't help wondering who's in the picture behind you. And did the person behind you say or teach anything around right effort? <laughs> well, the, the person in the picture behind me 
uh, is the great master Xu Yun, who was the uh, uh, one of the most um, beloved and respected uh, uh, Dharma masters in, of China. He was born in in uh, 1839, passed away in 1959 at the age of 120. He'd made the vow to be a monk for 100 years. He was so respected that he was appointed as the head of all five lineages of Buddhism in China, the Chan school, the Sutra study school, the Vinaya school, the esoteric school, and the mantra recitation school. And if any of you know about religious, that's like being appointed the head of the, the Lutherans, the Church of England, the Catholic Church, and the Orthodox Church, the, the Greek Orthodox Church, and the Russian Orthodox Church, and the Syrian Orthodox Church, and the Coptics, all at once. So he was seriously respected and beloved by the people of China. Um, he uh, was still teaching meditation retreats at the age of 114, and uh, he... Uh, uh, the, his teachings are, uh, you can find them in English in a, uh, a book called Chan and Zen Teaching, by, translated by Charles Luke, published by Ryder. And that was the very first meditation instruction that Ajahn Sumedha had when he was a layman in the Peace Corps in the 1950s. So uh, effectively, Master Xu Yun was Ajahn Sumedha's first Dharma teacher uh, through the books of, uh, uh, translated by Charles Luke. And, uh, and so the meditation method that Ajahn Sumedha used was from Master Xu Yun. So, uh, uh, and this picture was given to uh, a monk who was teaching in China, a, a British monk, Ajahn Jayasaro, who was teaching in China, and it was given to him by someone who had been a disciple of Master Xu Yun. He is also famous for uh, bowing, sp spending about six years bowing every third step all the way across China to make... Uh, uh, blessings for his mother and father, walking three steps, then bowing to the ground from one side of China to the other. That took him about six years um, as a kind of devotional practice, to, uh, dedicating his efforts to, uh, to, make, uh, to be a blessing to his mother and father. And um, he, uh, yeah, there's many, many stories about him, but uh, Master Xu Yun, H-S-U, uh, Y-U-N, means empty cloud. And uh, he was a kind of embodiment of right effort. <laughs> the, the meditation method that he, uh, he um, described, and I'll give you a bit of an example before we close today, was what's called the Hua To, or the um, using this, um, say, uh, reflective inquiry was the method that he used. 